Um, wait, well, uh, today we have uh, Sebastian. Uh, he will be talk, he will be talking about the asynchronous SQL alchemy. How are you, Sebastian? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you for asking. Yes. Where, where are you streaming from? Uh, I'm streaming from uh, the Netherlands uh, in Rijswijk. That's uh, near The Hague. Oh, nice. I mean, Amsterdam. <laughs> <Right now. laughs> oh, nice. Cool. Um, okay, I wish you good luck and thanks. Yes. Uh, you can start whenever you want. Well, hello everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Sebastian. I'll introduce myself uh, a little bit more later. Uh, but today we're going to talk about uh, asynchronous SQL alchemy. It's a very cool, new, and exciting feature that will be uh, uh, that's part of SQL uh, Alchemy 1.4 that has just been released. Uh, and this beautiful painting uh, is of an alchemist. You can see it at the Maurits House in The Hague if you're ever there. Uh, it's a beautiful painting of an alchemist, and I thought it was fitting for this presentation. Um, so since we're talking about asynchronous SQL Alchemy, uh, we also first need to discuss what the ingredients will be for this talk. Uh, and for that, it's basically this. We're going to talk about uh, what the differences are between synchronous and asynchronous input-output. Now, mind you, this is not going to be a, an introduction of async.io in Python, um, because this talk isn't about that. I assume that you've already uh, seen it, but we are going to discuss what the consequences are of async.io for SQL alchemy and what you have to do. Uh, then we're going to do a, a small comparison between synchronous and asynchronous SQL alchemy. Uh, what are the differences? Uh, uh, which parts stay the same? Do you have to relearn the entire uh, library again, or can you just rely on your existing knowledge? And uh, we're also going to talk about a very important problem that happens as soon as you start talking about uh, asynchronous input-output, and that is uh, eager versus lazy loading in your uh, uh, SQL alchemy objects. And this is uh, going to be very important. So we're going to dedicate quite a bit of time in this presentation uh, to that issue. Well, first of all, um, who am I? Well, I'm Sebastian. I'm 35 years old. I live in the Netherlands. And I'm currently working as a, a codesmith and developer for Ordina Pioneers. Uh, Ordina is an IT service company in the Netherlands. We mainly work for larger clients. So we are an IT service company. We do a lot of consultancy work. Uh, and then, yeah, you can think, um, well, governmental organizations or banks or other larger organizations. That's mainly what we do. And we really try to focus within our Pioneers unit on enterprise grade Python. So really developing Python as uh, enterprise applications. So it's really a lot of fun. Uh, and we have a fairly large team and it's a lot of fun to work there. Uh, I'm also one of the three owners of Python Discord. I don't really like the term owner, but it's a Discord terminology. Uh, so we just uh, stuck with that. Uh, and Python Discord is an online community for Python enthusiasts. We currently have uh, over 200,000 200, members which is a lot, but obviously it's a bit, little bit like Slack. So the actual uh, active number of uh, members is, is much lower, but still we currently have over 100 volunteers who dedicate some of their time to uh, discussing Python, helping others with Python um, or organizing uh, Python related events. So that's really cool. And I'm, I'm really uh, glad that, that I can be a part of that. And I'm, uh, I'm really proud of that. So that is uh, who I am. So now let's start talking about um, asynchronous SQL alchemy. Well, first, let's start to think, uh, let's first think about what it means for an application to be asynchronous. Well, and one of the things that's really important is that we're talking about asynchronous input and output. That's where the name async IO comes from. The IO stands for input and output, and that's really what's going on here. Now, first consider a very simple synchronous Python application. For instance, a very simple SQL alchemy application. Uh, as a developer, you may have an idea that uh, your application is structured in functions and classes and modules and files and packages, uh, and that you jump all over the place. But if you think about it from a Python perspective, then basically your application boils down to a list of instructions. Um, and this is what we call a single threaded application. We just have a thread of instructions 
and Python will execute those one by one for you. So um, and that is really simple. So Python goes to the first instruction, then it goes to the second instruction, and it will only move on to the next instruction once uh, that instruction is completed. It's not really relevant or important for us to really talk about what an instruction means. Um, this is really a very abstract explanation. But what is interesting is when we hit this red uh, uh, instruction here. This is an instruction that performs input and output. And in this application, that is making a query to a database server and getting a result back. Now, what's going to happen here in a synchronous application is that this call is going to be made. A uh, SQL uh, um, query will be sent to the database. There it goes. And then what you get back is a response with your data. And Python will just sit here on this call, waiting for the response to come back. And only once it's ready, will it move on to the next instruction. And this is basically what your a uh, single threaded application normally does. Um, in async IO, we're working with a slightly different model. Uh, so what we're uh, working with here is that we have an event loop. And an event loop means that you can have multiple tasks that are all scheduled to happen at some time. So instead of having your application as a long list of instructions, under the hood, it's still that. It's better to visualize your application in terms of uh, separate tasks that you want to execute. And you always have a current task that Python is currently uh, executing. But in addition to that task, you also have other tasks that are scheduled that are not yet being executed. They're just waiting there in that event loop until they get a chance to run as well. Uh, something interesting will happen here if we try to do the same. If Python will first just execute those instructions one by one, but as soon as it hits this uh, um, input output statement, uh, then something uh, interesting happens. We're going to wait for the future result of this operation. We're going to await it with the await keyword. And basically what that means, it sets the process of input output uh, uh, in action. It sends out the request, but then it also signals to the event loop. This task is currently uh, waiting for something. It, it cannot do anything else. Let's just put it back into our event loop like this. And then in the meantime, while task one is waiting for the result of that asynchronous input and output, another task can become the current task and can start executing um, instructions again. This is the basic, very simplified idea of async IO, very high level perspective. Um, but uh, what is important here for SQL Alchemy is that every little bit of input and output that we're going to do needs to be probably executed in such an asynchronous way. Because if you start executing synchronous input output calls, so calls that really need to wait before they get the, uh, the, the result back, uh, then you will block the entire event loop. So it's important that every task uh, that executes such an uh, input output operation really does that in an asynchronous manner. Uh, at the same time, if you now consider your new SQL Alchemy app, your fully asynchronous SQL Alchemy app, this is still something that, that is mostly about the uh, SQL Alchemy application itself. It doesn't really have anything to do with the database. So what that means is that, yes, we need to make sure that every bit of input and output, ooh, typo there, uh, input and output, uh, uh, is scheduled in an asynchronous way within our applic application. Uh, but the actual request that we need to send to the database and the re response that we get back, the actual SQL query, is going to be uh, mostly the same as what it would have been in a regular um, synchronous SQL Alchemy app. So that, in, that, that asynchronous input-output part is really about how you schedule your operations within your own application. And this has one really big advantage for every one of us, that means that basically all of what you know about SQL Alchemy already, how you build queries, how you use select, how you use with, um, and so on, uh, will translate almost one-to-one -to, -one to asynchronous situations as well. It's just about how you send out that query uh, that's going to be different. And I think this is really reassuring. Uh, there were a lot of uh, um, people fearing that when async.io was introduced in the standard library, uh, we would need to build some kind of 
a shadow standard library with all kinds of asynchronous features. You may have had that fear about SQL Alchemy as well, that you needed an entirely new SQL Alchemy with, all, with only asynchronous coroutine uh, functions that you had to relearn the entire thing, but that's not the case. You can basically use what you already know. I think that's, that's really great. Uh, do notice that there's an although here in this sentence, in the middle sentence, and that's what we're going to talk about later. There are some consequences uh, when you're using things like uh, implicit uh, or lazy loading of data. And that is going to be really important later. So, right, this was very high level. Uh, let's see some asynchronous SQL alchemy in action. What I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the uh, asynchronous piece of code with an asynchronous piece of uh, code. And both of them will take the same action. And then we can really compare what the differences are between the two versions. Uh, mind you, these, these examples are going to be very simple, very simplified, because this is not a talk about very advanced features, what you can do with the alchemy query uh, expressions. But this is much more about the difference between synchronous and asynchronous SQL alchemy. Uh, for those of you who are interested in reproducing these results, the versions I've used are Python uh, 3.9. I'm using SQL alchemy 1.4.22. And uh, there's an important note in the documentation about this, and that is that the asyncio extension is currently considered to be beta level software. Um, they predict that the interface is not going to change a lot from now. Um, but you need to be aware of that. It's probably going to be, uh, I don't know, I'm not involved with the project myself. I'm just a happy user of it. Um, but it's, uh, uh, my suspicion is that it will be released uh, in full with the 2.0 release. Um, when it comes to adapters, uh, I'm using uh, a, uh, async PG uh, uh, version 0 0.23 for my async database adapter and Psycho PG2 2.9.1 for my sync adapter, and I'm querying a, a PostgreSQL 13.3 database, and I'm running it in an Alpine-based Docker container. Now you basically know everything about my setup, and this is, I think, all you need to replicate uh, my examples. Right, so let's see something in actions. So first of all, we're just going to set up the uh, SQL Alchemy engine. And this is the synchronous uh, engine. And it's just using uh, SQL Alchemy dot create engine. I enter the uh, database URL um, and one precaution, never hard code your credentials like this, EuroPython um, colon uh, uh, EuroPython in production code. But here for this example, it's, it's clear. And my database name is also EuroPython and it's uh, located, hosted on the local host, host and should be accessible over ports 9876. I've also enabled the echo, which means that SQL Alchemy is going to output a lot of information that we can use later to explain some of the stuff that's going on. I've trimmed most of it in the output that I'm going to show you because there's a lot of output, but I am going to show you some relevant parts of it. And I've enabled the future is true, which means that I'm mostly going to use the new 2.0 style uh, querying uh, that will be part of uh, SQL Alchemy starting from 2.0. 1.4 is actually a really nice compatibility release. You can already start to use that new style query language. Um, and then your, your, then your application will be uh, future compatible. So forward compatible with the new 2.0 version. Since the async part uh, uses that exclusively, I've chosen to do that as well for the synchronous part here. So right, now I've got an engine. Let's see how that works in an asynchronous engine. Well, it basically works the same. Uh, the only thing I'm doing different here is that I'm importing the asyncio extension for SQL Alchemy, and that create and that that contains a function called create async engine, and I can use that to create a asynchronous engine for myself. As you can see here, I've specified the async C, uh, async PG adapter in my URL, but the rest of the data is basically the same. So at this point, uh, the two pretty much look the same. There are no awaits here yet, uh, which is also an important lesson. When you create an engine, there's no connection being made with the database yet. So you don't even know if your settings work. Uh, you will only see that when you first start 
communicating with your database. But now I've got an, 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 a synchronous engine and I've got an asynchronous engine that I can work with. Well, let's execute a very simple SQL statement. This is basically the same uh, introductory st uh, uh, a statement, SQL statement that you can find in the tutorial. Uh, I've just changed the text to hello Euro Python 2021. So I create my statum, a statement, SQL alchemy .text, And if I use the synchronous engine, I can just do with engine.connect as connection or con, and then I can execute the statement and I can print the result and it prints hello Euro Python 2021. Now, uh, what's the asynchronous version of that? Uh, that looks like this. And the first thing that you should notice is that the statement that I'm issuing is exactly the same. And that goes back to what I said earlier. The part that needs to go to the database is obviously just going to be the same query as that you're used to. The only thing that's really different is how you set up the connection. You now have an async context manager, async with engine.connect. And when you actually execute your statement on the connection, you also have to await that result. Now, once I have that result back, that's going to be a regular result again, um, because I'm not lazily loading in the results from the database. So if I then print the result, I get the same screen out again. So if you compare the two, you can see that they're pretty much identical only for setting up the connection. So the actual part needs to do the input and the output with your database. That's something that's going to be different, but the statements that you're going to execute are mostly going to be the same. So everything you know about SQL Alchemy, about making select statements, is just going to carry over to the asynchronous uh, SQL Alchemy. Right. That looked rather simple, but what's the catch here then? Well, I think the main catch is that you cannot simply rely on implicit input and output. And that's something that, that happens in uh, SQL Alchemy quite a lot, especially if you're using it naively, you're not really considering this, then SQL Alchemy will make implicit calls to your database almost all the time. To uh, uh, illustrate that, I'm going to introduce a very simple object relational mapper model. This is a traveler, and this is a really simple traveler. Uh, we're going to keep track of an ID, a created at field, a name of the traveler, and an age of the traveler. And what's important here is that the created at field has a server default. This means that if you create a traveler instance and you save it in the database, if there's no value for created at, then the SQL server will run a SQL function to get the current timestamp and it will use that as the default for that field. And what's important there is that this is something that happens in your database. So your application doesn't know that value until it has made a request to the database to ask for that uh, a value that's been created. So, and that, that's something that we can see in action. So here, when I create a traveler object, uh, Sebastian, that's my name, and I'm age 35, and I can save that into the database with my uh, with a ORM session. And then I uh, start my transaction and I add my object. But since I'm using session.begin, this will auto commit the object. So it will actually save the object in the database. Um, and that's basically what we can see here. So this is the, uh, uh, the, the, the echo output of SQL Alchemy trimmed down a little bit. And here you can see the actual database transaction going on. And this is until the print with the uh, separator um, that you can see on the screen. So you can really see here that uh, SQL Alchemy will insert this new traveler into the database. But now uh, we want to look at what happens when we want to print the created at date for Sebastian. So when the print statement hits here, everything below the separator line, you can see that SQL Alchemy has to issue another uh, uh, SQL statement to the database to get that newly created created at value because that was created in the database because it was a database default. So even a simple uh, attribute access like Sebastian.createdAt at here uh, uh, can implicitly send a request to the database for information. Well, in synchronous applications, that's fine, that works, but in an asynchronous application, that's not really going to work. So here we're trying to do the same thing. I'm creating a asynchronous um, session for uh, uh, for my ORM using the async session class. 
I've also uh, specified expire on commit is false. Uh, this is uh, a nice setting that means that my uh, ORM object will not completely will uh, be invalidated after a commit so that I prevent the number of uh, inputs and outputs I need. Uh, just basically, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to use my async session now with async with, um, and I'm going to add the database object. Well, that part's going to work fine. Um, but then when I get to the part where I want to print the created at here, let's just move it up a little bit. Then uh, it will try to retrieve that data from the database. It's going to make another call to get that created at value. And then you can see that you get a uh, exception. In this case, the exception is a little bit cryptic, something about a green let. We'll get back to that later. Um, but what it basically says here was IO attempted in an unexpected place. And that was what happening, uh, that, that is what is happening here. We cannot just use lazy loading in an uh, asynchronous situation. So what's the solution for this? Well, for defaults, there is a really simple option. If you go back to your ORM model, you can add a, a map your ar mapper argument called eager defaults. And this means that when you create your new object, it will also return the value uh, uh, of the default that was created in the database. Uh, so we're going to execute the same bit of code again. I'm just going to create uh, another Sebastian. Uh, and what you can see now in the SQL that's being emitted is that there's a returning part and that returning part has traveler.created at in it. So the database is going to send back that piece of information during the creation of the object. And then the print uh, happens without failure because the, the information is already available. Uh, so this is something you really need to think about. If there's anything that needs to be lazy loaded, you need to uh, take care of that. Well, there's also another situation in which a lazy loading is really something you need to take consider, and that is with relationships. Here you can see that the traveler is um, that the traveler uh, class has been slightly modified, and now it has a relationship with a country, and that's the destination country. So there's a destination ID, which is a foreign key to country dot ID, and there's a destination relationship attribute. So we can easily access that uh, country if we have a traveler instance. So what is the issue here? Well, it's basically the same. Let's say that uh, I'm going to add Sebastian to the database again, and Sebastian likes to travel to Norway because uh, they have a uh, nice environment that we don't have here. You can hike there um, in the mountains. So I'm going to add Sebastian here, um, but now I have an, an issue if I now going to retrieve Sebastian from the database again uh, with my session. And I'm then going to uh, uh, look at Sebastian's destination. Then I can see the destination is not loaded. And this is because by default, uh, SQL Alchemy only lazily loads in related models. And there's a simple reason for that. If you have a very complicated database with a lot of related models, if it were to uh, uh, retrieve all that information at once when it gets a single instance for a single uh, object, then you would make huge SQL queries all the time. So that's not really uh, something that's nice. So the problem here is in asynchronous uh, code, normally when you then access the attribute, uh, implicit IO will take place to load that destination from the database, but in an asynchronous situation, that simply cannot happen. So what's the solution? Uh, well, the solution is to modify our statement. Uh, and one thing that we can do is we can uh, do a joint load. And this basically tells SQL Alchemy, when you retrieve a Sebastian from the database, uh, you should also already load the, the related destination field. That means that all the information will be prepared in the database and will be sent to us in one single go. And now if I execute the same statement, and I get Sebastian from the database. Uh, you can see that if I print Sebastian, then destination is filled with Norway. And if I print something with uh, where Sebastian is going, it's going to say that Sebastian is traveling to Norway. So um, it's really important in a asynchronous SQL alchemy that you think about lazy versus eager loading, and you need to use eager loading where possible. You really need to think about what are the attributes that I want to use on this ORM model? 
uh, and you really need to load in that information uh, beforehand or you have to uh, load it in after but in an explicit io call using the asynchronous methods otherwise you will just get uh, errors all the time so that's really important you really need to take eager loading into account well then finally what if i want to run something that specifically uses asynchronous io function well there's also a solution for that and that is run sync and what uh, 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 async session dot run, run sync basically does it takes a, a synchronous IO function or a function that performs synchronous IO functions and it will uh, turn those into uh, asynchronous calls uh, under the hood using something called greenlets and greenlets and this is really close to the database uh, adapter level it's not something you see and that means that you that it allows you to use the uh, metadata.createAll, which is a synchronous uh, function normally. You can run that with run sync and then SQL Alchemy using GreenLat will take care of... Um, Hello, uh, we'll, Yes. Sorry to we'll, we'll take care of... Ah, am I over uh, time now? Yeah, uh, it's over time. Um, if, ah. if you want, you can finish or we can go for the questions. Uh, I, I need only uh, about one minute or so. Okay, um, okay. Go ahead. So, so under the hood, metadata.createAll will uh, now be called asynchronously. You can even do this with uh, uh, your custom SQL Alchemy functions, but it's really important. This only works for uh, SQL Alchemy IO functions. If you try any other kinds of IO, like web requests, they will not be transformed into asynchronous calls. So this is a really neat feature, uh, and it also allows you to use the old synchronous style. Just put it in a function and run it with run sync, and then suddenly all your synchronous calls will still work. So it's pretty neat, um, but uh, do be aware of how it works. Well, and then the summary. Uh, I think the most important thing is that you don't have to be scared of asynchronous SQL alchemy. Most of your knowledge will be directly transferable. Uh, you do need to think carefully about operations that perform input and output. And if you really want, you can still run synchronous functions that do synchronous database uh, IO uh, functions with run sync. And um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. It was uh, really nice. I've been using for for some time uh, SQL Alchemy 2.0, and I find it super cool. Um, yeah. You have some questions. The first one is uh, if you will be able to put uh, the code in a GitHub a public repo and share it in the chat later. Uh, yes, I will be able to. I need to tidy it up a little bit, but I will share it. OK. Uh, then are there any plans to change the defaults for asynchronous mode to use eager loading? I suspect nearly everyone will hit these issues at least once. Uh, that's a good question, but uh, I cannot answer it because I'm not involved in the project itself. I'm just an enthusiastic uh, user of SQL Alchemy. But there are some issues with eager loading by default. And that's basically when you have a lot of relationships and you were to always eagerly load all those relationships, that means that a very simple SQL call that uh, would only normally get you a minimal amount of information suddenly turns in this very uh, heavy long running SQL call in your database because it needs to load all those uh, relationships between models. And there could be many to many relationships in there and all kinds of other relationships. So I, I suspect that they will put the responsibility uh, at your feet. You really have to think about what is the information that I want to use instead of that they will just load everything for you because that can be very expensive. But that's my guess, so. Okay. Thank you so much. There are a couple of more questions. I also have a question, but I will add it in the in the channel. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you.